Creating a high yield, low risk dividend portfolio is a very popular strategy for both retirees and conservative investors. And that is strictly due to his focus on generating dependable, consistent passive income while simultaneously preserving or even growing principal over the long term. But the question is, how do you create such a portfolio? Where do you start? And what are some key factors that investors should focus on in their creation process? So in this video, I'm going to go over some of the most important criteria that I think investors should consider, and it will be broken down into four steps where each step will focus on some key financial metrics and ratios that will help break down the process. And this is where I want you to pay very close attention and make sure you stick around until the end because there's a big twist in the strategy that I think can really set a portfolio apart from the rest. Now, I've talked a lot about individual investments and ETFs, and I've done thorough analysis on them so that you can get a comprehensive understanding of how these investment instruments work and be able to determine whether or not they suit your investing criteria. Of course, at times I may favor a specific type of investment over another because I believe that managing a portfolio's composition and rotating it to adapt to the ever-changing landscape of the markets is a key ingredient to successful long-term investing. But I want to step back and just kind of look at the big picture here to avoid any confusion. Okay, so let's get started. Now, a high yield, low risk portfolio follows a completely different set of rules than a growth portfolio. Growth stocks and ETFs generate their entire total returns through capital appreciation, but dividend stocks generate their total returns through a combination of consistent long-term capital appreciation and dividend payments. So immediately it's clear that we have to work on a completely different set of key criteria that work in favor for dividend strategies. So here are the four primary criteria that I feel investors can use as staples in their selection process. Now, keep in mind that this can apply to individual stocks and ETFs. First is targeting durable business models. So overall, companies whose operations are essential and are relatively immune to disruptions in the economy are great choices for a high yield, low risk dividend portfolio. But how do you determine whether a stock or an ETF focuses on durability? Well, probably the most important component is steady revenue streams. Companies that have durable business models often have steady and reliable sources of revenue that are less susceptible to economic downturns. And I think that free cash flow is the perfect depiction of this. And free cash flow is essentially the money that is left over from a business's operations after accounting for all of its expenses, like operating expenses, capital expenditures, debt obligations, and other financial commitments. Finding companies with strong free cash flow is a key aspect of creating a long-term high yield portfolio because these companies have the financial stability and flexibility to distribute dividends without jeopardizing their ongoing operations or growth prospects. Very simple. And this leads to probably one of the most common stock picking criteria for creating this type of portfolio, and that is dividend growth. Dividend growth refers to the practice of companies increasing the amount of dividends they distribute to their shareholders over time. And a history of strong dividend growth is very important. So that means three or five or even 10 consecutive years of dividend growth. And you can find the dividend growth chart of many stocks and ETFs on Seeking Alpha, along with free cash flow data, valuations, and really anything and everything you need is there. Plus, you have access to comparison tables and graphs that provide a game changing perspective for creating a portfolio. This is my go to for research and analysis. I am using this platform on a daily basis. Now, for those of you who want access to these amazing tools and analytics that can help simplify your research process, I highly suggest taking advantage of my link. You can find it in the description down below and get $50 off their premium plan. Like I said, this criteria is seen in many of the ETFs that I've covered like DGRO, DGRW, and SCHD. And having strong free cash flow provides the financial foundation for companies to be able to initiate and sustain dividend payments and dividend growth to shareholders. Now, if we take a step back from dividend growth and focus on free cash flow, there is a metric called free cash flow yield. This is kind of in the same family where it represents how much free cash flow a company is generating relative to their market cap. The higher the percentage, the higher the relative free cash flow. But this can be targeted to companies of all shapes and sizes, like small cap, medium cap, or large cap stocks. But as we all know, these categories pose a different set of risks. And majority of the time when creating a long-term high yield portfolio, I would want to focus primarily on large cap stocks because they have already proven their longevity. But if you are interested in using free cash flow yield as a picking criteria, then ETFs that use this is COWZ or CALF. And I've already covered COWZ, but I will be covering CALF very soon, so make sure you stay tuned for that. 
Moving on, the second key criteria that I think investors should always consider is debt levels. Companies with lower levels of debt are generally more financially stable and are less vulnerable to economic downturns or financial distress. This is simply because interest payments on debt can fluctuate depending on the economic environment, which can impact a company's profitability, thus leading to higher levels of downside risk, which is not what we want. So in other words, what this means is that these companies are better positioned to maintain dividend payments even during challenging market conditions. And you see how this ties back into dividend growth, because a company can only consistently grow its dividends when it's able to overcome all types of market conditions. And a metric that is very common amongst many ETFs is the debt to equity ratio. Lower debt to equity ratios indicate that companies rely less on debt financing and are more financially stable. And like we said before, this leads to dividend sustainability and strong risk mitigation. Now, there's also an aspect called quality of earnings. So companies with lower debt to equity ratios typically have higher quality earnings. This is something that we haven't talked about before, but it is a crucial aspect of finding long-term investments and also determining their future prospects. High quality earnings are reliable and sustainable profits that are generated by a company's core business. There are no significant fluctuations or distortions and they accurately reflect the company's financial performance over time. Now, what do I mean by fluctuations or distortions and how does this relate to debt? Well, it's actually very simple. High debt levels can introduce earnings volatility because like I said before, interest payments on debt can result in fluctuating earnings from quarter to quarter, making it less predictable and potentially less reliable. This is not what we consider high quality earnings. High quality earnings are straightforward, consistent and predictable, which is what you want from a long-term investment. Now, just as a refresher, let's briefly run through what we've just covered. Companies with robust and reliable businesses often have strong free cash flow and free cash flow yield, which is a key component in consistent dividend growth. And on top of that, companies that rely less on debt to finance their growth can give insight into their consistency of earnings, sustainability, and predictability for the future. And again, ETFs that use these criteria are DGRO, DGRW, SCHD, and COWZ. Now, I've been a big fan of all of these except for SCHD, and I will get to that in just a second, so make sure you stick around until the end. Moving on to the third key criteria, which is strong competitive position. So these are companies that usually have a competitive advantage that allows them to maintain market share and pricing power over time, or in other words, they possess a moat. And having a moat allows a company to fend off competitors. Now, this criteria does sit in the middle of a dividend portfolio and a growth portfolio, but I do think that it's crucial to consider for long-term success. So let me explain. When you see companies like Coca-Cola, you know that they have a very strong moat because their brand is recognized everywhere. They have such a strong competitive advantage that it leads to higher profitability and cash generation. This results in stable and growing free cash flow, which then translates to dividend growth ability because companies with a competitive moat have reliable and sustainable earnings, allowing them to consistently raise dividends. They also have lower financial risk, less debt, and healthier balance sheets. So you can see how everything ties in together and how every component is crucial for creating that high yield, low risk portfolio. Now, how does Mo also lean into a growth portfolio? Well, the perfect example would be Microsoft. Microsoft possesses all of the criteria that we just mentioned, strong dividend growth, strong free cash flow, and moat. Microsoft's brand is recognized all over the world and the company's historical performance and consistent strong quality earnings make it a great candidate for both a dividend and a long-term growth portfolio. But if you're trying to focus on dividend yield, then Microsoft stock naturally isn't considered. At 0.72% dividend yield, it's practically nothing. But this is also where I think mistakes are made, which leads me to the last criteria, which is dividend yield. This criteria is what I think can make or break a strong dividend portfolio. And I know it's funny to say that because a dividend portfolio has to have a strong dividend yield, otherwise it's counterproductive. But you see, focusing on stocks that provide the highest dividend yield can negatively impact all of the other criteria that we've talked about. And this also leads into why I don't necessarily like SCHD. SCHD uses something called IAD yield in its selection process, and this essentially focuses on picking stocks that have the highest dividend percentage. But by solely focusing on this, you can miss some key aspects like competitive advantage and dividend growth. And the perfect example is again, Microsoft. This is a company that has been successfully growing its dividend distributions for decades and has an extremely powerful moat, but its yield is really low, which prompts dividend focused investors to immediately turn away. And in my opinion, that is a big mistake. 
But how can you compensate for the lack of dividend yield? This is where the big twist comes in, which is focusing on options strategies and ETFs that use options. This is, in my opinion, the secret sauce to maintaining a strong average dividend percentage throughout the portfolio. Right now, investors have access to so many different types of high income investments, and I've gone over a lot of them, especially covered call ETFs like JEPI. And JEPI is an ETF that sells calls against its underlying holdings to collect a premium, which is then distributed to investors in the form of a dividend. And these ETFs can not only boost a portfolio's dividend yield, but can also facilitate regular reinvesting, which can assist with dividend growth, portfolio growth, minimize downside risk, and improve longevity. Oh, and let's not forget that these ETFs typically distribute dividends on a monthly basis, which is perfect for consistent reinvesting and dollar cost averaging. Now, you can use option strategies on your own, but it can be a little bit difficult to manage. However, these ETFs make it a lot simpler, so I do think it is a mistake to exclude these funds from a high yield portfolio. So instead of having a criteria that focuses on the highest yielding stocks like SCHD, I would personally prefer to exclude that and instead focus on the first three criteria and then incorporate high income ETFs that use option strategies. And this also circles back to my overall opinion about rotating portfolio exposure. You see, at times of heightened volatility, high income ETFs can provide investors with a unique advantage because dividend yields on these ETFs tend to spike as high volatility causes option income to increase. And this relation between volatility and premium income is called Vega. Now, I went over this in detail in my previous video, and if you haven't seen that yet, I highly suggest you check it out right here. So rotating portfolio exposure can provide an extra edge into mitigating downside risk and improving overall total return. Of course, there are other components and important financial metrics and ratios to consider along with the ones that I've mentioned. But I think this big picture is something to definitely keep in mind, especially if you wanna start choosing individual stocks for your portfolio. And again, everything that we've talked about here is all available on Seeking Alpha from free cash flow data, earnings data, valuations, debt to equity ratios, etc. So I highly suggest you take advantage of my link to get $50 off your premium membership. And that is all for this one. If you haven't yet, make sure you subscribe to my channel and hit that thumbs up button for the YouTube algorithm. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you in my next one.